Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, police shootings. I do this with a little trepidation because um, uh, whereas I think I know lots and lots about various aspects of firearms uh, and we've done lots and lots of studies, we've done not very many, uh, very, very, very few about police and uh, about crime and we've left that to the criminologists. So I believe that virtually every criminologist here knows more about both police and crime than I do. And, and I could have talked a lot about suicide, but I'm going to talk about this. And a big reason I want to talk about this uh, is because we needed money, so we got money from the National Science Foundation. Uh, and because of that, uh, I'm required to say that this project was supported by award number uh, awarded to the National Institute of Justice. A lot of the opinions, findings, and conclusions have nothing to do with them. Right? Did it. Um, so you all should know that uh, the United States, uh, as it is in various areas, is really an exceptional uh, in terms of uh, police killing and being killed. Uh, this is from Frank Zimmering's excellent book, Where When Police Kill. And uh, you can look at other developed countries. One country which has very good data are, are Germans. Uh, and a US police officer on the job is 30 times more likely to be murdered than uh, a police officer in Germany, and consistent with that, uh, a U.S. police officer is 30 times more likely to kill a civilian, or really, a civilian in the United States is 30 times more likely to be killed by a police officer than a, uh, a citizen in Germany. And, and it's like, why? What is, what is going on? Um, so one of the things that we had done in the past was just to try to understand uh, across states in the United States why some states had a lot of police officers per, per uh, law enforcement officer being killed, uh, whereas other states had very little. And so you just run this simple uh, cross-sectional analysis and try to understand what variables uh, are best at, quote, explaining uh, these large differences across states and what is the variable that uh, explains more than any other variable that we have, and the answer is guns. Guns. That's, if I ask you a question, that's always the answer. Um, so um, you should recognize that uh, police officers, when they're uh, homicide victims on the job, over 90% of the time they're killed with guns. If you don't have a gun, uh, you're not going to get uh, uh, kill a police officer typically, and you try all these different things, and, and it's the household uh, prevalence of household guns, which is the key variable, and to a lesser extent, finally, crime rate also sort of explains this difference, and these other things don't. And this is not the, 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 the study, but it just tries to give you the flavor of uh, the differences. Uh, this just looks at the high gun states and the low gun states, uh, and so you can look at actual uh, numbers of law enforcement officers being killed uh, in this 15-year period. Uh, and we looked at the high gun states. Uh, these are typically uh, the southern states and the mountain states uh, versus the low gun states. So you had the same number of law enforcement officers uh, in this period. Uh, the high gun states not only have lots of guns, but they also have the most permissive gun laws. The uh, low gun states not only have fewer guns, uh, but they have more stringent gun laws. And what you see is uh, in the high gun states, uh, 263 uh, homicide victims during this period of police compared to 85 uh, in the low gun states. And this is not surprising, I think. Uh, again, because uh, if you don't have a gun, uh, you're not going to get killed. If you go to a um, domestic violence dispute as a police officer, if there's no gun, you will not die. If there is a gun, you may die. Uh, what we were uh, funded for uh, by uh, NIJ and our funding ends in three days, I think, uh, though we're not finished, uh, is first to validate the data, which is always important. Uh, then we're just trying to explain the variations of police killings across states. This is variations uh, we look, just looked at as variations of police getting killed. We're focusing now uh, on police killing uh, civilians. Uh, describe the variation across the rural-urban divide, and I just want to talk a little about the National Violent Death uh, data set, which we're enhancing in a typology. Um, so uh, one of the things that we had shown is that uh, the, the data, and people understand this now, the data from uh, police, the data from uh, death certificates, in terms of how many 
people police are killing in the United States were no good, even though there had been a number of articles trying to explain variations in across states in terms of civilian deaths by police using the SHR, using the whiskers, the vital statistics. I think those are not any good at all because nobody quite realized how bad these data were. And it's not sort of randomly bad. You miss over half the data uh, from uh, the uh, police reports, and it's not sort of a random half. It's sometimes you miss a lot, sometimes you miss very little. Uh, the National Violent Death Reporting System, which is this wonderful system, uh, we get a little credit for help trying to help create that system, and so I, so I always uh, promote this system. Uh, this is a system which combines data from the police, data from the death certificate, and data from the medical examiner slash coroner. Uh, every death uh, is, has two narratives, one from the police, one from uh, the medical examiner. So you really get a flavor and understanding of what really happened, uh, as well as uh, consistent coding of all these things. Um, so what we did uh, was now to try to validate NVDRS. We knew it got lots, lots more of the homicides. How, mu uh, how many did it really get? Uh, and in the last five years, four or five years, uh, there have been all these web-based data systems from the Washington Post, which is collect collecting all these data from the Guardian, from Fatal Encounters Org, from Mapping Police Violence, from the Gun Violence Archive. Uh, and we took for the 27 states which we had data for from the National Violent Death Reporting System, one of the problems with NVDRS is that we didn't have all the states. It's only this year that the, all the states have been funded. Um, and found that uh, of 404 cases which were mentioned in any one of these, uh, NVDRS got 97% of them. Uh, the Washington Post actually got close to 98% of them. So these data sets were collecting lots and lots of, of virtually all of the deaths. And so uh, because the Washington Post data, which uh, haven't been validated in terms of the circumstances or anything like that, uh, we figured we could use that in terms of the total numbers because it looked like it was very, very uh, reliable. And uh, it also uh, collects for all 50 states, which NVDR does. So um, here we're going to use the Washington Post data for the police killings. Now, one of the things about the Washington Post data, it's only for police shootings. Uh, and so it misses probably six or seven percent of the of the fatalities, of some of which occur uh, when someone's incarcerated or, or whatever. But that's what we're using. Um, and uh, again, we're trying to explain the variations in police killing civilians. Why, uh, in some states, uh, I think New Mexico, uh, they kill um, uh, ten times higher than New York, uh, ten times more people per capita. Uh, is that right? Yeah. And, and why is that? Uh, and so you just give, again, you can just throw in all the variables, the, the, the normal variables, and which is the key variable that explains most of the difference, more of the difference than any other variable? And the answer is guns. the guns. Um, uh, and that makes sense because why would a police officer kill somebody? One of the big reasons is because they're afraid they are going to get killed. And again, the only reason they can get killed is because somebody has a gun. Um, and uh, also, a police officer may kill someone because they think they have a gun. And where they pe people think they might have a gun is in areas not like Massachusetts, where virtually nobody has a gun or carries a gun, but in places where there are lots of guns and lots of people carry guns. And you don't have a lot of time to think about. Um, and so uh, we looked at um, the fatal police shootings, which uh, for this uh, fairly recent period, 2015 to 2017, 93% of all law enforcement homicides are shootings. Uh, about a little under, there's a, about 1,000 police killings a year, uh, law enforcement homicides. Uh, and so just looking at the shootings, we got a, a little over 2,900. Um, in a big range. Um, you can look at either fatal police shootings per population, or if you want to try to hold more of the crime rate, uh, fatal police shootings per arrest. Uh, and again, what jumps out is poverty doesn't matter, urbanization doesn't matter, percent nine white, white doesn't matter. What matters in terms of explaining the variation is, is guns. Um, and violent crime rate uh, matters some, but not nearly as much as guns. Um, 
And again, just to give you a feeling, here's high and low gun states uh, for this time period. Uh, uh, we uh, just picked them uh, so that it, you sort of match in terms of the total number of civilian person years at risk. Uh, the low guns, the high gun states again are places like Alabama, Georgia, Idaho, Kentucky, Louisiana. The low gun states uh, are Kentucky, Hawaii, Massachusetts, where I'm from, uh, New Jersey, where the Sopranos are from, uh, <laughs> New York. Uh, and again, what you see is huge, huge differences that sort of beg to be explained by something. Um, it looks like there's probably something to do with guns um, because that's um, who's getting, you know, guns sort of matter in terms of the killings. Uh, total civilians killed about 500 in the high gun states compared to only 85 in the low gun states. Huge, 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 huge difference. Um, now, uh, Dan Nagin, whose paper is not quite out yet, but it's been cited a couple other places. So he's done looked at the sort of the same sort of approach and find, found again, yes, what is the key variable which explains these differences? It's, it's guns. So if you don't want someone from public health, here's somebody from criminology who you can trust uh, in, your, in, in, in your tribe uh, who, 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 who finds the same thing. All right? Now, one of the things we're trying to do of interest, I think, is trying to understand uh, police killings uh, by rural, urban, suburban. Uh, is there big differences? Why are there big differences? And so forth. Um, and so a question might be, is are killings by police more of an urban problem or a rural problem? Um, it, it, it seems to me that it's probably would have been, one of the nice things about doing studies is you don't know what you'll find in descriptive epidemiology always. Uh, but uh, I've always been taught by reading criminologists that crime and homicide is an urban problem in the United States compared to a rural problem. This is, I don't know, I, I got this state online, I think it's for 2015, it just sort of says again, hey, it's not the rural, it's the urban. Uh, Frank Zimbring, who I just quoted before, when police kill, says no one's done a study to look at this yet, but quote, there's reason to believe that death rates when police activity uh, are usually substantially higher in big cities than they are in suburbs, towns, or rural areas. So that would sort of be the working hypothesis. This is more of an urban problem than a rural problem. And again, this is what you read about uh, most, right? So we tried to look, and what I found is I always thought people knew what urban, suburban, and rural were. I, I, they have no idea. I mean, it's just like, holy smoke, I didn't know that. People, I read articles, and it just says, you know, this percent is urban, and this is this, and it's all, and they never say, well, there's different ways to classify, to categorize. If you look at a different way, maybe you get a different answer. So um, two of the prime ways that people have defined urban, suburban, rural are either using county as the base uh, or using zip codes as the base. Um, the, uh, the county is often used in public health. Uh, and often, not always, they use the NCHS urban rural codes. H is health, the National Center of Health Statistics, health, all right? Uh, that's semi-based on the USDA RUC codes, the rural urban continuum. DAA is agriculture, all right? So we got health, agriculture. Then some people have used zip codes. Uh, NCES, E is education, all right? So we got health, agriculture, education. Uh, then we have the census, which is just about uh, population density uh, at the zip code level or the level. And then the one I like is the 538. Uh, so 538 is the website. And what 538 did is they uh, uh, did a, got a random sample of a little over 2,000 people. And they asked them, do you live in an urban area? Is your house in an urban area, a rural area, suburban, or a rural area? And they said, and they said, what's your zip code? Right? And so they have 2,000 people who are saying, and then they found the population densities of each of these zip codes, and then they said, which sort of maximizes the correct answer in terms of what they said, and they had these sort of various cutoffs, these two cutoffs about what is what population density we should call uh, urban, suburban, and rural, which maximizes the, 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 the right. So these are the five things I just want to look at. <coughs> county, uh, talking to geographers, county is, uh, makes sort of sense to use in terms of about place. A lot of uh, uh, administrative functions are done in the United States at the county level. 
Uh, the zip codes are often much smaller, so I don't think that's what you might want to use, but zip codes aren't about um, administrative anything often. But zip codes are, are better in the sense looking at so space zip codes are more often if you saw what places looked like in a zip code, you'd think, oh, yeah, this is rural. Oh, yeah, this looks like suburban, uh, much more than the county. Uh, where my um, mom was, was raised was Worcester County, Worcester County in, in Massachusetts. And Worcester turns out to be the second largest city in New England. And Worcester County includes Worcester, but it also includes all the suburbs of Worcester, which and the second largest city in New England is very small. Uh, it's all, this, all the suburbs, and it also includes rural, rural areas. And it's considered whatever. They, have, they pick one. It's, it's one. Um, so anyway, so these are five ways sort of to look, right? So first, looking at the health way of classifying. And they divide things into six. So we're looking at the shoot, police shooting deaths, fatal police shootings for three years, and dividing them into these six areas. Uh, what's interesting is that what they call metro of uh, all these data we decided to put in the, uh, in, uh, the population is from the 2010 census because. Um, uh, so for, for the NCHS non-metro, which I guess is rural, rural has only 46 million people. So remember that, 46 million people. It's a very urban area. Uh, and the large fringe, I guess, is the suburbs. This is the big cities, the suburbs, the smaller cities, and so forth. Uh, and what you see is, if you look at um, the, the rates of legal intervention firearm homicides in the metro versus the non-metro, it doesn't seem to vary at all. It seems like this is, a, if you believe that, uh, the large metro point of 0.035 looks very much like the non-core, which is the most rural of rural. Uh, the, um, Maybe I can just tell you no, I can't that. The large fringe metro, the suburbs look a little less. Still not hugely lower, but somewhat less. So just looking from this, it looks like, gee, this is a problem across the board, maybe a little less in the suburbs, but not a huge big city problem, except there's a lot of people in big cities. Uh, if you look at the percent of victims armed with a firearm, there's many more people armed with firearms in rural areas. Uh, and not surprisingly, I think, uh, there are more people who are dying from police fires, from police guns, uh, who are armed in rural areas than in, in, in urban areas. So this is one way of looking at it, but, you know, non-metros. The USDA, they divide things into, um, I think, 12 categories. I'm just, I just broke out the metro because there's a lot of people. These, these, the breaking out the other three areas, they get tiny little people. Small, small number of people. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and again, here it looks like the, the rural areas are at least as bad. If, if certainly not better. Certainly uh, urban areas aren't better than, the, than, than, the, than other areas. It looks like maybe the non-metro urban adjacent to metro is probably suburbs uh, is a little better. And again, uh, the percent of the victims who are armed with firearms tends to increase with rurality. Right? So that's what it looks like, sort of the county. So. It's the sort of semi-consistent leads up. And here, again, if you consider all this sort of rural, here you get uh, about 40, 46 million people. Now, the education uh, approach using zip codes, you see they are putting 140 million people in rural areas. Okay? That's their, the way they define it. All right. Okay? Um, the, if you're looking at that, the suburbs of 88 million, so the, sort of the cities, the large, medium, and small cities don't have very many people uh, here. Uh, it looks like um, this is the one area that looks like maybe the cities are a little worse, though the rural remote is still the worst, okay? But here it looks like, again, suburbs, suburbs seems to do the best, as always, uh, and cities, the, the bigger cities seem to do worse than the smaller cities, uh, and the more rural seems to do worse than the less rural, but, so maybe this is a little more of a city problem here, it's hard. If you look at 
the population density from the census. They divide things into three regions, three. Uh, urban area, urban cluster, rural, uh, you know, I would guess rural cluster, I don't know, urban cluster, maybe that's suburbs, it's hard to, anyway, urban areas and rural areas seem exactly the same, urban clusters seem a little bit, be little bit better, but not hugely better, and again, always, the more rural, the more likely if you are killed by a police officer that you will be have armed with a gun. Uh, then what I like, the 538 definition, uh, here, you know, everybody in the United States thinks they're some middle class. <laughs> Half the people in the United States think they're living in suburbs. Um, the, none of the official, you know, descriptions of basically suburbs in these other four places say that you're living in a suburb. They say there's more. But here, half the people are living in suburbs. Uh, a fair, a lot of people, 80 million, much higher than uh, are given in, in uh, er by the agriculture or the health, uh, think that they are living in, in rural areas. But again, you see the same thing. And again, you see the percent of, you know, likelihood of having a firearm. So this is all the same data, just put in different boxes depending on how it's. And my, you know, conclusion is there are at least, I'm sure there are probably other ways to describe urban rural, but from these five ways, there are lots of ways to categorize by almost any measure, rates of legal intervention firearm homicides are as high in rural areas as they are in r urban areas. This is not an urban problem. This is a US problem. And, and they're lower in suburban areas, but not that much. Yes, suburban is safe, but not that much. This is pretty, I mean, compared to most things I have seen in lots of areas and injury and so forth, this is pretty even. Um, and uh, you, the people in rural areas are more likely to have a firearm uh, on them when they're when they're being killed. Um, now, uh, guns are a huge problem in the United States. Um, racism is even a bigger problem in the United States. So let me divide things by uh, fatal police shootings by urbanicity and, and race. Let's see what's going on. Um, all right, so I'm just going to present one thing, because, and this is from the NCHS, the health statistics at the, the county level. And I'm just going to look at the whites and blacks, the Hispanics is going to have room for, they're sort of in between. Uh, what this says is for whites in the United States, large metropolitan area, whites in large metropolitan areas have lower rates than whites in non-metropolitan areas. Uh, in the, the, the fringe, the large fringe, the suburbs are still the safest for whites. But if you look at these numbers, um, it really looks like, hey, you know, 0.29 versus 0.22, somewhat, somewhat different. Uh, for whites, this might be a little more of a rural problem than an urban problem, we be getting killed. If you look at blacks, now almost all blacks live in metropolitan areas, but the notice blacks are two and a half times more likely to be killed if you're a black person in uh, if you are a black person in a, overall, you're two and a half times more likely to be killed by police than if you're a white person. But for blacks, uh, it, there's a big difference in rates uh, between the metropolitan and the non-metropolitan area, but there's only four million people here. But you put these two together, and then you have the Hispanics, which are sort of straight even <laughs> between the rural. That's how, this is how you get that the rural and the urban are, are consistent. Uh, right. Now, I was surprised by this, I, you know, uh, not by the differences, uh, but that, that, that whites in urban areas seem to be safer, a little safer than whites in, in rural areas. And so I just want to look at this for overall homicide, because I've always believed that for overall homicide, it's the urban areas that out of line. You say, urban, urban, urban. You break this out by race, whites in the urban areas in the United States are safer overall for overall homicide than they are in the rural areas. Whites in rural areas in the United States are more likely to be murdered than whites in cities in the United States. All right? That's what this says. And I can show it. 
relax on the other hand, oh, it's just this the most horrible th you know, thing, the most shameful thing ever. Um, if you look overall, it's what, 10 times as likely for a black person to be murdered overall. Um, and blacks are somewhat more likely to be murdered if they live in urban areas than in rural areas. And you put these two together and you get that overall in the United States, people are more, be more likely to be killed in urban than in rural areas. But just breaking it down by race in a simple way seems to have a big, big difference and helps explain things. Um, a little silly factoid. Um, if you are a white in the United States and you are fatally killed by, by a gun, which, so these are all just firearm homicides, 14% of the time it will be by a police officer, which just seems enormous to me. 14% of, of white homicide victims who are killed with guns are killed by police in the United States. For blacks, even though blacks have a much higher rate of being killed by police than whites, because they're so much more likely to be killed by other citizens than whites are. Uh, for blacks, yes, this is a bigger problem than for whites in terms of being killed by police, but in terms of their overall firearm problem being killed, it's much less of a problem. And for the others, and Hispanics are 7.9, and everybody else together isn't that many people. It's also about 7.9. All right. Now, a couple other things that will stop. Right, what? I'm sorry. Is that, that's not all on the line of duty? Um, yeah, this, 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 okay, so I'm trying. So this is all um, where, when they're active duty police. So it, it, if you're a police officer and you kill your wife, that doesn't count. Uh, you have to be on the job. Now, I'm trying to remember, I think if you're off duty and you're in a bar and you kill someone, I, I, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it counts or not, but I, I forget. It, it either does or it doesn't. But. All right. Two other things, and then I'll stop to give time. Uh, one of the things we've been trying, so oh, most of that data, that data is from the Washington Post. But I love the NVDRS. Why are we doing it the NVDRS? So the NVDRS data is great because it is so rich. Uh, and because the data, you know, being collected are collected in a consistent, comparable way, so you can really make, because I, I didn't present anything, you know, any covariates for any of these things. But if you use NVDRS data, you could, but it's not in all the states. What we wanted to do is make the NVDRS even better for police homicides. Uh, and so we have read uh, all the narratives for uh, uh, more than a year of police killings, uh, which meant that I've read in the last you know, six months about 250 double narratives of police killing. Uh, we have added uh, about a dozen variables now. Uh, so we know, we know the number of police on the scene, which isn't regularly coded. We know, was there taser used at any time? How were civilians involved? Uh, were they involved? Uh, in bringing the people together, how would, were they at the scene when the, when the killing occurred? Was there a car chase? Was the person killed in the car or not in the car? Was it a routine traffic stop uh, and so forth and so on? Um, one of the things about civilians, you should, the, the police are killing uh, civilians to protect themselves 90, 98% of the time. They are not protecting other civilians. They're for civilians. Civilians sometimes is around, but who they are protecting is themselves. Um, and that's why the person having a gun is so important or not important, because that's how they can, how they as police can get killed. Uh, one of the, there's so many impressions about reading all these cases, and it's all jumbles in my mind, but uh, so, so many of these you read and you think, if this is, the medical examiner says this was happened, the police say this would happen, this is what happened, it really made sense. If I was a police officer, oh my goodness, you'd be scared out of your mind and you better protect yourself somehow. Um, but for some, it's like, oh, this is the most, it's, it's, it's just disheartening, it's just so sad. And one of a, a number, there are I think six that I read were this basic thing, which is, I think, this is just the saddest thing ever, is the parents are at home with their male child who's in their tw 20s, and who's living at home, it seems like. And the kid has, the young person has some problems, 
Uh, maybe they're bipolar and they're not taking the medication. Something's going wrong. And the parents are afraid. They want to protect, protect them against maybe he's going to kill himself. Maybe he's going to do something crazy. We, we just, we need help. They call 911. The police come five minutes later, the kid's dead. And it's like, there must be a better way to, for people to protect their children who are going through these than to call 911. There has to be a better place to call. Um, uh, um, so now what we're, we're, we're doing is using these rural urban differences and looking at are there really differences in what's going on in these police shootings in the rural area versus the urban area. My hypothesis is that, for example, there's a lot more intimate partner issues in rural areas, and particularly because there's guns there. Uh, and so forth, and we're creating a topology of police shootings, which we haven't quite finished. But that's, uh, I think topologies, if they're, if they're done well, are really incredibly useful. So you can put in your mind, here are the five ways in which people tend to get killed uh, by police, and have, it gives you a feeling for what to think about them. Thank you.